Hello. Hey there. Looks like we're already live. Yeah, I decided to just jump right in. Okay. <laughs> and yes, I've already opened my Barolo. Oh my goodness. A Barolo, <laughs> you're you're taking out the good stuff today. I am. This has been sitting on my wine rack for about four weeks now. I bought it mm. about four weeks ago. I went through the Sangiovese and the um and the Monte. I think it was a Monte. So I'm finally opening up the Barolo. I'll I'll have to go and replenish my uh your wine stash. <laughs> yeah, my stash. <laughs> we actually replenished ours today because I had I had some champagne from a tasting I had gone to that I had ordered and it finally came in. So we had to go pick it up today. Right. And uh, so we, we restocked our cabinet. So we have lots of champagne. Yay. <laughs> curbside pickup? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Curbside okay. pickup. Um, my wine there was store, a lot of people out though. Like, it's, it's changing. Yeah. It's changing. Um, I just did an interview with Chris Henry he runs a hospitality lodging consulting firm out of Los Angeles. And he said, he said, you can tell people are done. They want to get out and it's changing. Yeah. Do we want to invite anyone to our happy hour? Send our link. Uh, absolutely. I'm <laughs> going to go forward it right now on my page. I've been trying to alert people to it. Awesome. So let me just. Now it's in a group. I did it in the group today. So I want. Oh, yeah. I, but I think, um, I, I guess we'll have to post it in the group. I wonder if it'll allow me. Jo just... Joan is watching. Maybe she I wants to Joan. join us. <laughs> Joan, if you want to join us, I'm going to drop the. I'm going to drop the URL. The Zoom link. In the group. Excellent. Ah, oh, what a week. You Tell know, me about it. It's chaos. Just, it's chaos. It's weird. There are people just going through experiences and, and telling me now about them, you know, very private experiences that it, we're all, it's wearing on all of us. Mm -hmm. um, so let me just write here. If you would like to join us in the actual Zoom, Click here. So, and you know what? I'm gonna. Can I? Can I edit up top without driving it crazy? I don't think so. No, not while we're actually. Broadcast. Not while. Yeah. yeah. You just have to put it in the comments. I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so, everyone. The link is in the comments if you want to join us. <laughs> please do. Please um, do. <laughs> So I, we can talk to you. <laughs> you know, and, and I think that's the key. Um, I, Myrna and I have been talking about how we're both zoomed out. Mm -hmm. And um, there are a lot of these webinars that are going on right now where um, you sit there and listen to people. Yes, you can comment. Um, some of the groups are more intimate, like a rival. Doug Quinby really knows his um, members of his company. Um, there are small tour companies that are part of Arrival. Um, and so he has an active engagement with them and he talks to them and, and you know, waves at them. And, and that I think is what I need from Zoom meetings. I'm on too many Zoom meetings where there's no engagement and it's just a bunch of people droning on and talking about, um, talking about things at a level that's not intimate and i think that's been a big problem for me because it just doesn't do anything for me it's it's boring and it's, mm -hmm. it's dead hey joan i think our audio is connecting yeah but um yeah that i'm not i'm not happy with and i i could do with a lot less of those and i am not accepting invitations to, to a lot of those yeah i've kind of had to like put a stop to the webinars <laughs> Like, unless it's something really like earth shattering, I'm just skipping it Yep. because it's just too much. It's like every day there's like five webinars about something that's remotely relevant. And uh, excuse me. Hey, Joe. Hey. Hello, what? can you hear me? Yes, yes I, can. I can hear you. Oh, it's Nina. Oh, it's, oh, Nina. it's Nina. Hey. <laughs> Hi. 
Hi. N Nina, if you've got if you've got systems issues, Myrna's uh -huh. the person to solve your system. She sets up <laughs> systems and processes like nobody's business. I had a Zoom meeting this morning and it went really well. So let's I mean I'm I think I need to connect the video probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and there's something oh, but, about that. There's is that what you mean by systems issues? No, you were saying that you needed somebody to help you organize your systems. Oh, oh, right. Oh, okay. I didn't know if you saw that yet. I did. Yeah, I we replied. Saw it. I replied to you. Oh. <laughs> and he tagged okay. me. <laughs> and I tagged Myrna. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, great. Maybe we can set up an, a different time yeah, too. Yeah, we can. Right. Absolutely. Huh. You may regret having <laughs> offered that. <laughs> <laughs> Janine writes, if you have Zoom, you are not drinking enough. <laughs> <laughs> I so I I did a um I did a travel unites us with Christine Karst and two travel advisors last Friday night. And the engagement, it was so engaging. And there were other travel advisors on who were talking and offering ideas. And I'll tell you, that to me, an hour and 15 minutes went by like that because we were talking about something we love and we could see each other's faces and people were laughing and raising glasses to each other throughout the call. And that's the kind of Zoom meetings I want to hold from now on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you got a pretty day outside down, you're in Florida, right? Yes, it is. It's beautiful today. It didn't, and it didn't go over 90. So we're really blessed. Nina, nice. are you in like West Palm? I'm in Royal Palm, Western Royal Palm. West Palm. Yeah. Okay. Because I have a dear friend of mine. She's in West Palm and she has the same setup above her pool that you do. Yeah. The screen. Yeah. Because the mosquitoes will kill you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I get them anyway because I have to get a bigger dog door because I have a 110 pound uh, dog now. And I keep the doors open so he can go in and out to chase the squirrels in the yard. And, uh, so I know. He loves to chase the squirrels. But yeah, it's a, it's, um, it's nice here. I, oh. I'd rather be in Peru, but yeah. I'm very grateful that I'm here. I know, I know. Nina, you and I have to go tag team on Elizabeth Hansen. We got to get. She's very, she said, I, I thought I might hear from her today. She said she's yeah. swamped. She's absolutely in. Um, I've got so many people who are, who I, you know, more and more people are, are as I think of this and who can be involved, but is she, but she's, you know, she'll do it. She's great. Yeah. Well, we got time. She's, yeah, it's just small. it's just I want to I want to get Wilfredo on the radar screen as soon as I can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, he'd love to. I, yep. I so, so many people who would love to. Everyone is so Lo lovely, man. Lovely man. He's oh, rich. He there. Everyone that you meet <laughs> from Peru, will, you'll say the same thing about. You'll just love them. I have. Um, kids who travel with us, families. I don't know someone. I saw something. I think we're going to talk to someone about family travel the kids cry when they leave our guides mm, that's sweet cry that's how i mean it's just so i mean wilfredo is just he, yeah i don't mean he's just one of them but uh, they're just spectacular people that you get to travel with which is i think i guess you'd rather look at the pool than me anyway <laughs> either way to, it's up to you <laughs> This week, my gray is this much. <laughs> oh my gosh. I well, know. I'll tell you, I'm getting a little bit vain because my, my, my very little bit of hair is growing in quite a bit. And uh, it, it looks awful when it, when it grows. Yes. In my, <laughs> if I step out of the shower and my hair is still wet, it's too long. Yeah. It's too long. Mm. Oh, me too. That's why I don't even put it down anymore because then the contrast is so b bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> it's too funny. But I mean, because well, I have naturally black, almost black hair. So it's like, you know, talk about salt. It's not even salt and pepper. I mean, it's like salt and pepper shakers, two standing apart. <laughs> you know? I had I had naturally black hair up until about 22 years old. And, and then mm -hmm. it started going gray and I started losing it. I was very distinguished at 27. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think wild men are, are very handsome. So. Thank you. Well, there you go. <laughs> So, um, you know, I've, I've been thinking about what to say today for a, a couple of days, because I think I'm going through, and, and I know I've heard it from several other people, um, Nina and I have actually had this discussion as well, is the longer this drags out, it just seems to wear on you. 
Mm -hmm. And as much as we try to keep a stiff upper lip, as much as we try to laugh, um, and even some of us engage in gallows humor, um, it is, it's, it, this is not easy. When something drags on for a very long time and you don't feel like there's an immediate thing you can do to make it better, um, depression can set in. And um, you know, on occasion in my 55 years, I have gone to see someone because of issues going on in my life and uh, one of the best therapists that I had, she said to me that depression is the absence of hope. It's not sadness. It's, it's the absence of hope that things will get better. And that to me is a very good segue into um, a little story I wanted to tell everybody today because um, something happened to me approximately four years ago, I had to do the math, um, that I have been holding on to ever since, um, especially when things get dark and especially when I feel like there's no hope. So I'm just gonna quickly tell you the lead into the story then tell you the story itself. And I hope what you take away from this brief um, little exercise here is that even on a day where you're living in some kind of darkness, where you're, you're dealing with something that just, there doesn't seem to be any silver lying in any of the clouds above you. There are, it's about our perception and it's about the energy that we gain from changing our perception. So with that, um, I went through a very, very ugly divorce. It, uh, it to some degree, <laughs> <laughs> to some degree, it's still not over. Um, and I'll tell that story another year. Um, but anyway, if I can take you back to the year 2016, um, I had to shut down a coffee shop that I had purchased. Um, I had owned it for about three years, closed it in March of 2016. Um, the divorce had started in 2013. And this person was just, you know, attacking me and the store. And it just got to the point where I could not keep it afloat. And it was one of the saddest days of my life when I had to put a little sign up in the window saying, we'll be closing next week. Um, so the, the, you know, the coffee shop gets closed and now I'm doing some travel writing for Travel Market Report. And uh, the summer comes, uh, I was dating a woman at the time and she was an integral part of my life. Um, she helped me um, sustain the coffee shop. She was a brilliant businesswoman. Uh, Myrna, she had a JD like you. <laughs> she was a lawyer by training um, and just really a, a, a brilliant, fascinating person who actually also turned me on to Italian Reds. Um, and anyway, um, December 2016 comes and uh, you know I'm barely keeping it together. I've got a daughter that I'm trying to keep in college. Um, and, and this other person in my life, my, my ex-wife, dealing with our children was not one of her strengths. And I'm just going to leave it at that. So my eldest, my daughter, and my middle child, who's now in college himself, um, they really clung to me quite a bit. Um, they looked to me for stability, uh, to solve problems. Um, you know, Nicole, in seven semesters of college, I, I was the only one who drove her, dropped her off picked her up, brought her home. My ex just couldn't find a way to be a bar Nicole's life. So anyway, December comes um, and this woman and I break up. It was a very uh, sudden and to this day unexplained um, fracture. And the holidays come and I'm pretty much close to penniless. I'm living at my um, brother's uh, house about 20 minutes from where my kids live because I was not safe in that home around my ex-wife. It just, it was, a, it was not a hospitable situation. Um, and uh, New Year's Eve comes and um, uh, one of my best friends <laughs> to a local spot to, um, oh, hold on, Jenny's here. Hey guys. <laughs> I'm just letting Jenny and Joan in. Hey, Jenny, how are you, dear? I am good. Hi. Cheers, my dear. <laughs> Cheers. I'm still on water. That's I know, okay. me too. That's okay. You guys are now. <laughs> it's only three o'clock here. Yeah. Here too. Yep. <laughs> so, um, 
So New Year's Eve was on a Saturday that year. And uh, in my tiny little town of Cornwall, it's a lovely little town. There's a, there's a, there's a great coffee shop called the Two Alice's. It's, it's, when there's no coronavirus, it's where you can find me on a Saturday or Sunday morning hanging out with Kevin and Joe and John and all my buddies. Uh, but anyway, that Friday night, my uh, one of my best buds um, invited me out for a beer at the captain's table in Monroe, near where he lives. And uh, he was heading up to Syracuse, where he comes from. And he said, look, Rich, I'm not going to be around for New Year's. Can we just grab a beer before the end of the year? So uh, I go to the bar with Todd, and we both have one beer each. And uh, he uh, gets ready to say goodbye. And gives me a big hug. And as he's stepping away from me, he looks at me and he goes, you know, why so sad? And I said, Todd, what have I got to be happy about? You know, I just broke up with Gene. Um, I'm pretty, my bank account's down to pretty much nothing because um, the, the house where my kids were living, um, that Monday, so this is Friday, that Monday, I walked into the house to get my 20 year old, who was then 17, to take him to the high school because he was doing winter track, uh, walk into a house that's like 47 degrees. There was no oil in the tank, and I had to do like a $350 emergency um, oil delivery from uh, a buddy of mine owns Reynolds Oil, and uh, I've got like no money in my bank account. Um, there's no sign, there's no end soon in the divorce. The other person loved dragging this out, and the judge was not saying, let's cut this thing off. Three and a half years of, of battling in courts with lawyers, and what a mess. So anyway, I'm like, Todd, what have I got to be happy about? And he looks at me and I swear to God, he looks at me and he goes, but Rich, you're Catholic. Don't you believe in miracles? And I said, Todd, <laughs> you know, listen to what's going on in my life. You know, where's the miracles here? You know, lost the shop. I'm, I'm bankrupt from that. I'm bankrupt from this. Still haven't filed for bankruptcy, but financially I might as well be. Um, but anyway, um, he says, well, he said, you know, I, I just hope that New Year's, you know, in the new year, you can find something to, to be positive about. So the next day I go to this place, the two Alice's, and I'm sitting at a table and anybody who's ever seen me do my basic level training program about storytelling, um, that's what I was working on that Saturday morning. I got there early. I used to go to this coffee shop because it's close to where my kids live. And if I were to get a phone call or a text message for one of them saying, hey, dad, can you come pick me up and take me here or there? It was 10, 15 minutes away versus 20 minutes away in Warwick, New York, where my brother lives. So I'm sitting there um, on my laptop working on that training, um, on those training slides. And I hear a guy sitting behind me who I've never heard his voice before. And he's talking to a, a dear friend of mine, Bill Weber, who's a couple of seats next to him. Um, and they're talking about law of attraction. And I know my buddy, Bill Weber, he's not a spiritual guy. So anyway, um, you know, Bill is kind of just, you know, kind of, what, what's the word when you're not pandering? Uh, he's, he's placating this fella um, by just kind of going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So at one point, this guy said something, and I don't know, remember exactly what it was, but it caught my attention enough that I spun around. Hold on a second. Somebody's in the chat. That's one of Meredith Hill's favorite topics. Yes, Joan, it is. <laughs> Uh, so I spun around and I swear to him, I jammed my hand almost in his face. And I said, my name's Richard D'Ambrosio. What's yours? And he looks at me and he goes, he goes, Ziggy, uh, Izzy Zohar. And I said, with a name like that, I want to hear your story. So Izzy starts to tell me his story. He's uh, an Israeli emigre, uh, comes to the United States, starts a construction company in Queens. Um, he tells me, he said, Rich, at the height I was worth millions. I was building buildings all over Queens. I'm making money. I got trucks and crews and everything's going great. He said, and then my wife files for divorce. And he said, Rich, it was a painful divorce. It was ugly. And at one point I finally said, you know what? I'm not fighting this out in court. I'm just done with this person. Whatever she wants, I'll go figure this out on my own. And he said, and you know, he said, my lawyer and my accountant both told me, okay, if you do that, then file for bankruptcy. It's the best way out of all this other debt. And Izzy was like, nope, I'm a man of my word. I want to pay my debts. And he said, he said, you know, Rich, um, I started studying, you know, different religions and I started getting an encouragement inside myself and I stumbled upon this law of attraction thing. And he, uh, he said, he said, all of a sudden, you know, I, I moved to Florida. I started a new construction company. I, I caught the front end of a real estate boom. So he said, that was good fortune. 
he said, but you know what? I'm worth millions again. And here I am, you know, living a life that I never could have imagined in the middle of those ugly days of my divorce. I was like, wow, Izzy, that's a pretty interesting story. He said, well, what's your story? I said, not much different than yours, except I wasn't worth millions. And I tell him pretty much what I told Todd the day before. And, you know, I kind of bring Izzy up to, you know, the moment. New Year and this is Saturday, New Year's Eve. I bring him up to that moment. And I'm like, you know, I just broke up with this woman who I just adored. And I you know, lost all this money and this business closed. And who knows when the divorce is going to end. I'm telling him my tale of well. And uh, he goes, Rich, you know, I, I really would love to continue this conversation. He gives me his business card. Um, he said, but my son lives here. He said, and the reason why I'm up is to see my son and we're about to go to brunch. He said, so really lovely, you know, meeting you. Um, you know, let's try to stay in touch. And as he sticks out his hand to, uh, to depart, he looks at my face and he goes, why the long face? And I looked at him and I said, I just told you my story. What do you mean by the long face? He said, well, he said, you're Catholic. Don't you believe in miracles? And now I'm hearing Todd's voice from the night before. And it kind of caught me as weird. And he goes, Rich, he said, miracles happen every day. Don't lose your faith in miracles. Okay. New Year's Eve comes and goes. New Year's Day, I'm at my brother's. Uh, I was living out of the den at the time on the couch. And, um, and New Year's Day dinner goes... Uh, to 4, 4.30 at, at Lori and Greg's house. And um, Lori and Greg don't really raise their children by faith. My, my brother Greg is an atheist and Lori is a cultural Jew. She's not a practicing Jew. And, um, and so they really haven't raised their kids in any kind of spirituality. And they thought that I was a fairly novel person being in the house because I studied the Bible for four years with the New York Archdiocese. And I've got, if you come into my bedroom, my bookshelves are just lined with spiritual books. Everybody from Martin Buber, to Abraham Heschel, to Thomas Merton. Um, so uh, they always thought that Uncle Rich was kind of cool because he would talk about things in a way that was different than his parents. But my brother and my sister-in-law raised my nephew and niece, Rebecca and Stephen, raised them in a manner that I wouldn't have raised them in. So like at seven, eight years old, Rebecca was watching movies like Saw, does anybody here know the movie Saw, the series? Saw is about this wacko serial killer who, who kidnaps people, chains them, and then gives them a saw and says, if you want to survive, you got to cut a body part off the leaf. So he would chain their arm and they'd have to cut their own arm off in order to escape. This is what my seven, eight-year-old niece is watching. Stephen is a couple of years older than her. So maybe he was 10 at the time of this story. So <laughs> New Year's Day dinner ends and Rebecca says, Uncle Rich, will you watch a movie with me? I'm like, oh my God, I'm already depressed. The last thing I need to do is watch some guy torturing people and cutting their bodies up. No, no, no. She's like, please. So, you know, I'm living in my brother's house. I'm like, okay, no, I, I got to do the right thing. I'll get through this. Maybe I'll fall asleep. So um, we go into the den and uh, Rebecca is clicking through the DVR and she comes upon this movie called Miracles from Heaven. Anybody here ever hear of this movie with Jennifer Garner? It's only about four or five years old. It's not been around very long. So uh, anyway, um, the story, and it's supposedly a true story, though, of course, you know, whenever a movie is made, you know, they have to dramatize it a little bit. So not all of it's true, but the core of it is true. And the core that's true is that um, there's this family in Fort Worth, Texas, around Fort Worth, Texas, uh, husband, wife, they live on this beautiful farm. The husband is a veterinarian, three girls. And they're all, you know, from like 14 to 10 to seven or something. And uh, this is the movie that Rebecca puts on. So the movie is about, and I'm not going to, I hope I don't ruin it for anybody, but the movie is about the middle child comes down with a stomach disorder that's fatal. And it's a very rare disease. Um, and uh, the only doctor in the country at the time the story happened, I don't know if since then, if there's anybody else studying this disorder, but the only doctor who was having any success in mitigating the symptoms, not curing people, but mitigating the symptoms, is this guy at uh, Boston Children's Hospital. And so uh, somehow Jennifer Garner, this mom, forces her way into this man's program. His, his office had told her, we're full up. And the only way that a spot opens 
and, and you're on a waiting list with hundreds of people, families in front of you, the only spot, only way a spot opens is if a child passes away. And Jennifer Garner, as this mother, Christy Bean, is determined to not allow that to destroy her daughter's life. And so she goes to Boston and somehow she gets her daughter into this program through will and a little bit of luck. And um, the doctor does mitigate her daughter's um, uh, symptoms. And the family takes the daughter home to Texas. And one day while she's playing with her older sister in an old hollowed out tree in the yard, she falls down the middle of the tree, 25, 30 feet to the base. And she's stuck there. And now at this point in the movie, Jennifer Garner has walked away from her faith. She does not go to church anymore. Her husband's struggling with her because he's still a faithful man. Um, it's, I think it's kind of an evangelical type of church. Um, that's the best I could glean from watching it. Um, and uh, like I said, she's completely walked away and she's lost her faith. Well, when her daughter falls into this tree, um, she at one point goes up to the tree and starts praying. And then... Uh, the Italian in me doesn't allow me to tell this story without getting choked up. Um, and then the family comes and they're, you know, on top of Jennifer Garner, you know, praying at this tree base. And the daughter is plucked out by uh, a winch. And uh, when they get to the hospital, the doctors do a diagnosis of her and they say, she only, she's got a couple of scratches on her, no broken bones. If she landed on her head, there's nothing wrong with her spine. We don't see anything other than some minor scratches. So they release her the next day. And Jennifer Garner is obviously as a mom, she's happy. Um, and then she starts noticing that the distension on her daughter's stomach is going down and her symptoms are going away. And she's not complaining about pain. She's not um, taking her medicine. And now Jennifer Garner is freaking out. So she puts her daughter on a plane and she flies her back to Boston to this wonderful doctor. Uh, but the character is just wonderful. I don't know if the doctor actually is. And she says to him, explain this to me. And he does a die. He does a, he examines her and he says, she's asymptomatic. And the mother says, what are you talking about? And he said, she doesn't seem to have the disorder anymore. And so the mother says, are you calling this a miracle? And he said, I'm a scientist. I'm not allowed to say that. And so the family goes home. And uh, now this is national news because it was national news the night the child fell into the tree. Um, you know, the, all the national television programs came out. And now somehow, I don't know if the beams, you know, followed up with the news media. But now the pastor at her church says, look, you got to come back. This miracle just happened in your life and you need to explain it to the congregation. So uh, cameras line, the pastor allows the camera crews to line up um, behind uh, the church and after mass, um, Jennifer Garner's invited up to the pulpit to, uh, to tell her little story. So now remember what Todd said, Rich, but you're Catholic, don't you guys believe in miracles? And then Izzy Zohar the very next night, says, Rich, you're Catholic. Or the next day, next morning, you're Catholic. Don't you believe in miracles? They happen every day. And pretty much what Jennifer Garner says, not verbatim during her little soliloquy, is that we all need to be aware that, <laughs> that miracles happen every day. So that night, I'm lying in bed on that couch, and I'm looking up at the ceiling. The tears are pouring out of my face. And I'm going, okay, God, I know. When you say something three times, when you said to Peter three times, you will reject me. When Jesus sees Peter on the shore and he comes up to him and he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? I know. In my faith, when God says something three times, God's trying to shake you by the shoulders, get your attention. And I'm thinking about these three successive messages. And something jogged my brain at about that time. Something Izzy had said on Saturday about a book that he had read that had helped him. So now I Google it. I'm sitting there. I can't fall asleep. I'm, I Google it on my phone. 
And I come across this woman, JJ Flazane. She's out in Los Angeles. Um, she studies the law of attraction. She's, you know, kind of into holistic things. And she was starting a 30 day challenge um, on Facebook for meditating and for, you know, trying to clear a space to allow for new things to come into your life. So, you know, only because I was Googling it did I even know she existed. And uh, I click on it, I register for this program. And for 30 days, pretty much nothing happened. I tried what she was advising all of us to do. And I'm putting posting pictures and uh, on her Facebook group, and I'm, you know, following her uh, mantras, and it just wasn't working for me. So when that ended, that 30 days ended, I just informed everybody in the private Facebook group, I said, Look, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to be posting every day on February because nothing happened to me for the whole month of January. Maybe I'm just not in practice. And then the funniest thing started to happen. Um, in the mornings when I would do my meditations, I could feel a tingling in my fingertips. And if I actually put my hands apart like this, there was an energy pulsing between my fingers that my fingers would go numb. And about Three weeks after that started happening, a friend of mine from the University of Pennsylvania Medicine calls me and says, Rich, I got a huge project. I need you on it. I don't, I can't trust anybody else. Um, it's worth about eight grand. And now all of a sudden I'm like, holy shit. Divorce, you know, court sets a date. We go in, we finally sign the damn thing. That's over with. Uh, Airbnb calls me. I had a friend of mine who was working at Airbnb at the time, Rich, I got a project. Can you, can you write a couple of things for us for corporate travel? Six, $7,000 from that. And all of a sudden things are changing in my life. Um, my daughter and my son, uh, my daughter was away at college in March. Um, she moved in with me when she came home from college, she moved in with me full time. And this, this lovely <laughs> two bedroom apartment that I have, um, my son Christopher moved in. Um, Tyler goes back and forth between his mother's and mine. And all of a sudden, things start to change in my life. The best part was that I was at peace with the past. I'm not angry at my ex for what happened during that divorce. I'm not. I'm a little upset when she does things today that I now have to go deal with and I can't put more money towards my son's college tuition or something else, but you know what? I've come to a place of peace and optimism that I think I always knew was there, but for some reason I needed God to shake me on those three successive days, these three little messages about miracles to not stop believing that things could get better. Cause that's where I was at that point. Things can't get better. They'll probably only get worse. And you know, who knows how bad things will get. And things were pretty bad back then. So I guess the moral of the story um, for anybody who's really struggling right now, you know, you've, you've had to give away tens of thousands of dollars in income let alone the hundreds of thousands of dollars in sales. You know, I've been on a couple of webinars this week talking about when is travel going to come back? And, and there's not a lot of certainty around that. I mean, there's, there's some people talking 36 months before we get back to what things look like, you know, the best part of 2019, 36 months, maybe longer. And that can wear you down. It's just, just being lot, landlocked like this, you know, getting up every morning and saying, you know what, for the sake of society, I'm going to go for a walk. I'll go to the grocery store. <laughs> when this bottle of Barolo is empty, I am going to go get another one. But otherwise, I don't get very far afield from where I live right now. And it wears on you. But here's what I can tell you. Is that mir little miracles do happen every day. It's about how you are going to look for them. It is about how you are going to put yourself in a mindset to realize that your buddy who's asking you out for a beer is a messenger from God. That Izzy Zohar, who to this day I have never seen again, my daughter found him on Facebook because for a little while I was thinking that Izzy didn't exist and I made the whole thing up. <laughs> 
you know how when things happen and like a couple of years later you're like did i did i come up with this to kind of rationalize this whole weekend my daughter found him on facebook she's like dad is this him yeah and guess what i found his son who does live in cornwall too <laughs> they do happen every day and so you know it really is about mindset it's about perception it's about it's about trying to find a way and and we do this in the catholic faith we have this thing called the examen e x a m e n it's done by the jesuits and and it's something usually done at night where a jesuit mostly priests um, will take a look at the day that they've just lived and say where did i see god you know where did i act the way god wants me to act where is the way that i didn't act the way so they go through this thing called the examen and it's about finding these little miracles and what that eventually does is it when you're in that kind of practice, it's the, the bad days are less bad. They're less difficult to get through. And I think you can create positive energy that'll pull you out of something. Because if it wasn't for JJ and for me clearing out the crap that I was still holding on to, I don't know if, you know, Dinah and $8,000 from the Pennsylvania Medicine, uh, University of Pennsylvania Medicine was, could have came to me. And, and I'll tell you, so I've even got a vision board. I can see it right now from where I'm sitting. And um, JJ had us do a vision board. And I can tell you about 65% of the pictures on that vision board have come true, including a picture of a coffee shop. And uh, it's right next door to Coastal Carolina University. The only reason why I was thinking about that coffee shop and put it up on the board was because the woman that I had been dating, she and I, she had, her son goes to Coastal Carolina University and she used to go to that coffee shop when she was down there visiting Jimmy. And she would call me and take pictures and go, Rich, why don't you do this with your coffee shop? And you know, she was coaching me along on how to improve the place that I was owning. And I put a picture of that place up on my, um, my vision board. Fast forward to 2018. Summer of 2018, Chris and I come back from dropping Nicole off at college. And um, I said to him, you know, Chris, senior year of college, you got to get your act together. What the heck are we doing with college? He goes, Dad, I think I want to go to Coastal Carolina University. <laughs> it just came out of the blue. Two months later, I was sitting there having a cup of coffee, working on some training programs. This is real. I know it's hard to believe, and I know I sound like a whack job, but I really do believe that when you put intentions out there that are about the things that make you happy, you know, the hopes and dreams that you have for your life, that happened to be specific. And sure enough, Chris pulls Coastal Carolina out of the the blue of thousands of American colleges he could have chosen. That's where he wanted to go. I really do believe in it. And hopefully that gives you the ability to take more control of your life and not think that you are at the whim of coronavirus. You are not at the whim of all of this misery that we're going through. You still have some semblance of control. And it's about the energy and the intentions you put out there. Um, I will always advocate for that because I've lived it the last four years. So I raise a glass to all of you that this weekend be one um, that you have the peace and quiet to find a place that if, if there is some darkness that you see the little miracles that are happening every day in your life and that that is the beginning of a string of positive things that turn your life around. So salute to all. Thank you. I just have water. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I'll be switching to something later. Maybe it might be martini night this week. This week was hard. <laughs> this was a hard week. I've had a couple of mornings this week where it was tough. I'm yeah. not kidding anybody. Yeah. Jenny, how are you feeling? Hanging in. Yeah. Yep. Uh, it's every day I get up and I'm glad I still have a roof over my head and 
keep smiling. Amen to that, sister. Amen All to I can that. do, otherwise I'd be under the covers feeling sorry for myself, and that's not going to put any money in my pocket. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Don't do a damn thing. Nope. Mm -mm. <laughs> uh, you know what? It really is a wonderful life. It really is. <laughs> as, as gray and dark as it gets, it is a wonderful life. Joan, I don't need to get, you're in. So I don't need to send you the link. I'm just checking all of everybody's notes. Um, Jenny. You're good, Joan. You're doing good. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing fine. Um, good. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually had a good week. I got some stuff done. I still, you know, I, I think everything I'm working on is kind of like a puzzle and I have to have like all the pieces in the mm -hmm. right place, you know, to make this trigger this, you know, mm -hmm. you know how that is, but it's been yeah. a good week. Yeah. Well, good. So you're making progress. Yeah, yeah. definitely. That's Je excellent to hear. Jenny, Nancy says hello. Hello. <laughs> and Richard, the picture that's behind me, this is the Traboco in Abruzzo that you know, when we were with Massimo yes. a couple weeks ago and I couldn't do the pictures, but that's what that is. Mm -hmm. So that's a, is that a restaurant or is that where they pull well, the it, fish out? It's both. Um, so they, they, uh, like you can kind of see, um, I, I don't know how to show you um, where the nets kind of like hanging off the side mm -hmm. of it. They have nets that they lower down to the water and then they bring them up and they have like little buckets where they scoop the fish out. And they also skin dive down there and they chip out, you know, like oysters and mussels and octopus and stuff like that. Cool. So they're allowed to cook on there what they've caught themselves. Massimo cool. was grilling today, but you saw that. You know that. Yeah, the arrostatini. I, I hate lamb, but when he made that the one time we were there, I tasted it and it didn't make me gag. So. <laughs> I love lamb, but yeah, when it's cooked like that, it's amazing. Yeah, it was. I mean, it's just like really small cubes of meat and it's marinated in olive oil and mm -hmm. garlic and lemon juice and oregano. And then yeah. that, that machine that he had, like when we were there, they had just gotten that. So it's a machine where you thread in those wooden skewers and they buy those like in five kilo boxes, you thread them on the machine and then the machine, it's like each one is like a little rotisserie. So mm. it's like turning it over the coals. Nice. So, so he, I guess it was like four years ago when we were there, they had just gotten that and we're trying it out. That's I didn't so realize cool. May Day was such a big to do in Italy. Yep. Yeah. It's kind of like a Memorial Day for them or something. Well, I mean, it used to be also like a celebration of workers. I don't right. know if it still is. And, and it was also at one time like a spring festival, you know, and they mm -hmm. would celebrate with flowers and have a May queen. But in Catholicism too, there's the May crowning. Yes. You know, I mean, I worked in Catholic healthcare for 25 years. So the May crowning was always a big deal, you know, and, and my one hospital where there were all different kinds of ethnicities every year, like a different group got to do it. So it was pretty cool. Like you'd have like a Filipino May crowning or an East Indian May crowning. You know, it was, it was very interesting. So I guess it's more like Labor Day than- Yeah, than, maybe, yeah. probably. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I can't wait to go. I wanna, I wanna go see that palazzo. <laughs> we should figure it out. We should take a group. <laughs> yeah. We'll get there. We'll yeah. get there. It's kind um, of funny, like, you know, I'm just thinking like, you know, one of my things was the first time that I went overseas, it was a lot easier than I thought it was. And since then I've been a lot of times. And I mean, like, technically it's still as easy to get there, but now it's impossible. So it's like this, this conflict. You know? oh, it's really, um, it's really crazy to think how we just took that for granted all these years <laughs> that we could just get on a plane and go wherever. But I am grateful that I traveled as much as I did in the last few years. And so I've, you know, I've been to a lot of places that yeah. most people have, you know, yeah. haven't. And so, you know, it's okay to take a little pause. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I mean, just as luck would have it, I went on a Christmas market cruise in December and then mm -hmm. went right back to Europe again with my husband and my stepdaughters. We went to Marseille for a week. And then after we got home, I had the chance to see all three of my kids and Rich saw two of his kids. And now we don't know when they're going to see them again. I have one in DC, yeah. one in Memphis and one in Chicago, you know, and I'm out here in California. So who knows when we'll see them. Yeah, again. it might be a few months. Yeah. Well, they are, um, so in Italy, today was the first day that they've lifted the lockdown. Um, my friend Jessica, who lives outside of Pisa, she did a video of her hitting the button and opening up the, the courtyard gate so that she could go out on the streets. <laughs> so 
there's a little bit of sunlight there. The Italians are trying to see what they can do. Um, mm -hmm. My daughter has said something about coming over here from, from Beacon this weekend. She's like, Dad, what if we just set chairs up out on the grass outside, stay six feet apart? And I'm like, sure. <laughs> Your father's not going to deny uh, having you uh, having you at his home. Good gracious! So you know there are some good things happening, and um, we we've just got to hold on to that. We've just got to, you know, it's not going to stay this way forever. And and when we finally get back to living a normal life, whether it's you know traveling to Disney World or flying to you know Naples, Italy. Yeah, there'll be some new things, but maybe those new things aren't going to stay around for very long because this disappears and, you know, we will, we'll get to herd immunity and we'll have vaccines and we'll have, you know, new ways of living that keep us safe. And that, that's what I'm looking forward to. I, I'm not sitting here going, the good, the good days are over. Bullshit. Just bullshit. I'm not, I don't believe that for a minute. Nope. No, we'll we'll be okay. You know, we've been through enough. <laughs> we'll be able to to live the way that makes us happy again. It's coming. Yeah, we just don't know when. <laughs> don't know when, and then it may be different. And what will that be like? You know. Yeah, there's a there's a newsletter I get from this author Austin Cleon. It's a great newsletter. It's um, it's always oh, like him we, on Twitter. Oh, I love him. Anyway, he. Today, to this follow. week's newsletter, I'll forward it to you so you can subscribe. Uh, one of the links was a blog he wrote. It was basically like, no one knows anything. <laughs> it was the name of the title of the blog. And it's really so true because you have all these like experts out there saying, well, I think it's, this is going to take eight months. And I think it's going to take 12 months. And I think we'll be traveling in September. And truth is, no one knows. No one knows anything. All we can do is speculate, look at some data, but nobody really knows. And I think we just have to accept that. <laughs> just go on. <laughs> just worry about like, like, like Joan is like focusing and working on her business. Yeah. And stay busy with that. And, you know, whenever it does end, you'll be in really good shape. You know, <laughs> I think that's really the most productive thing we can do right now is, is just focus on what we can control. Absolutely. And, and don't dwell on it. You yeah. know, just, just, you can't dwell on it. I, I don't know about you guys, but I only watch three press briefings and I hope this doesn't get political. I only watch three press briefings a week, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays around 11 o'clock Eastern daylight time is when the WHO has their briefings. Um, and I find Tedros and Mike, and Maria to just, they just go over the facts and they let you know that things are progressing and they have intelligent discussions about things that are way beyond my pay grade. Um, but that's really it. I don't spend a lot of time, you know, my, a lot of my friends are watching all the other press briefings. I don't, I don't even watch Governor Cuomo's press briefings. I got no interest in them. Look, I kind of glean what's going on. You know, things suck, they're getting better. Uh, we might start loosening up the state of New York by the end of May. Yeah. I get it. I get it. My son, Tyler, is not going back to school. You know, schools are closed through the end of the academic year this year. So he'll finish off, you know, in June online. But I don't really need to overwhelm myself with all of that. You know, I just don't. Well, I think that's it. When everything first started happening, you almost had to stay on top of it, especially because we had clients other places right. and you know, all of that. But at that point, it was so, got to be so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And so then I think really like first week of April is when I kind of backed off mm -hmm. and our governor does one every day at 2.30. But if it's going to be anything important, the Chicago Tribune puts out information beforehand. Mm -hmm. So I know if I need to tune in or not. And yeah. that's it. Otherwise, I'm I'm done. I know I'm locked in my house, and you know that's all I can do. But it it would be different if you were getting any concrete information. Yeah, I know. But, but I'm know tired of hearing the same stories over and over, and all the reports of all these people getting this, you know, all the CARES money and everything. When I'm sitting here with nothing. <laughs> So I just got off the phone with a guy who runs a hotel development company out of Los Angeles. He does millions. And he said, he said, I didn't get any. We applied. 
we got screwed. And he said, all these big hotel chains were doing it through their subsidiaries so that they could fit into the program. But they're part of a conglomerate. Mm -hmm. But he said there were loopholes. He said, they got, they sucked it up and stuck it to the rest of us. Yeah, a friend of mine who is um, in financial services, his, um, his friends in that industry, which they're in financial services, they should know what to be doing. And he said, none of them need the money. None of, it's not affecting them like it is our industry, but their banks all called them and said, you need to apply, you, you might as well. Right. Yeah, that, that happened a lot. Um, I, I actually got, got mine today. My P, I applied for the PPP and I had to do it twice. But, and I'm with Chase, big bank. It's not big, it's a tiny loan, but you know, whatever, it works. I'm, at least I got something, but uh, I, I wasn't sure it was gonna work because that first time, that first round, um, I mean, I heard nothing. Uh, my husband banks, his business banks with a small bank. And so he he had like hand, hand holding the whole way. I mean, it was so nice. Like I had to kind of just fight with Chase and they finally put a website up and I was able to apply. Like once they got it all organized, it was really easy. It was just so nobody knew at first, like what it really meant. Like this, you know, so if I'm an independent contractor, like how do I count my income? Like no one knew. So we didn't know what to submit. And anyway, it's like, a disaster but finally it worked but um but yeah so i so i've heard today like a lot of people are starting to get approvals smaller businesses so i mean i think the second round is way better than the first round so yeah, they closed the loopholes they said yeah they closed, well right? yeah some of them at least right. some of them exactly so, um but no but it's still it's still unfair because yeah if you have a really good relationship with a banker of course you're gonna get way better service and they're going to put you at the beginning of their list whereas if you're not you just have to kind of fend for yourself and fight with the bank so joan in, in answer to jenny joan asked you where you're based in illinois yeah she just answered yep i just answered okay i'm about oh. an hour south of chicago right now <laughs> So when you say the PPP, is that, are the, is that the small business loan? Like yeah, that's, that's the small? payroll protection small business loan. Yeah, I got a, I saw a deposit in my corporate account yesterday, really small, like a thousand dollars. And I th that's the disaster SBA. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You can still apply for the other one. Okay. It basically replaces your adjusted gross income. Like if you pay yourself like as a sole proprietor, you don't pay yourself through a W-2, then you have to submit like your Schedule C on your tax return and whatever your adjusted gross income was last year, divided by 12 is your monthly payroll. And then they multiply that times 2.5 and that's your loan amount. And it's- Okay, I didn't, I, I, I applied a while back and I got a claim number from, S, from small business. And I, then I saw that deposit yesterday yeah that's because that was straight a word i don't know and i submitted everything yeah i applied for that one too but i also got the thousand dollars like last week and that was it and no like paperwork because <laughs> there's supposed to be like a loan that goes with that but i haven't heard anything about well, that, that. I, what i applied for they asked me for all the for my yeah i know i submitted all that stuff too yeah yeah but I haven't heard, gotten anything other than the thousand and the twelve hundred dollar stimulus check. But uh, yeah, but the PPP you have to apply through a bank. You can, you don't do that on this oh, okay. well, website. Sorry, right. yeah. I didn't do that. Is it too so late? Should, to do that? No, try. Just try. Okay. It's worth trying. Um, it's Joan, worth trying. Joan, what's the coincidence? I was just typing in here. Um, he went to Southern Illinois University at Carbondale, and that's where Rich's family, he's got family in Heron, which is right next to Carbondale. And I was just going to tell her, I grew up in Hyde Park, and my family was there till I was 14 when we came out here. And then after 10 years, I went back when I got married to my first husband, and I was back in Chicago for 31 years before I got divorced and moved back out here to the San Diego area. But the Carbondale thing, that's the coincidence. Well, Jenny was on a call with me about five, six weeks ago with a kid who lives in Manila, the Philippines. And he goes, he went to SIU. <laughs> Always a Saluki. <laughs> so there we have our three things, right? <laughs> there you go. Look for threes. They're really Definitely a small world, that's for sure. Yep. <laughs>
Well, I do hope that everybody can can genuinely laugh inside. Um, I, you know, my favorite one of my favorite phrases is, "If you don't laugh, you end up crying." <laughs> so, to me, it's better to laugh. It's better to try to find some kind of humor in, in, in things because. I mean, it's, it is, I, we just lost a substitute teacher here in the Cornwall High School. You know, he, he was an ambulance corps member from Washingtonville and he's gone. And he was only like 50, no, I think he was 60 years old. He lost a 32 year old father of five. In the so sad, in the I, I know. You know, it's, we're still here, the, this group. We are still living and breathing and we still have so much. To be thankful for and and i'll tell you i've learned the hard way that just just getting up in the morning is a miracle mm -hmm. it really is and when you start looking at life that way everything changes one of the nuns i used to work with used to say where there's life there's hope and it's true <laughs> yes it is she also used to say are you living or are you dying <laughs> <laughs> my father used to say uh, he said look if you if you're vertical this morning count your blessings yeah, it's true. <laughs> no, I mean, Lance and I have had like some of the best meals ever. Like we've been cooking like crazy, like and cooking crazy stuff like paella on a weeknight, you know, like, you know, like, yeah, we're going to make like all this. So it's actually been kind of fun. Um, honestly, that part of it, just like, you know, really just doing stuff together like that, that normally we're too busy to cook and we can take out and and don't feel guilty about it, you know. And it's, today, it's, we were able to get takeout sushi from our favorite sushi place for lunch. And it was like, oh, my God, it was like a miracle eating sushi again. Because we've been, like, trying to stay, you know, close to home. And it's on the other side of town. But, you know, things are a little more open now. So we're like, let's, we got to do some errands anyway. Let's go. Pick. Like, this is, like, my first day out of the house in six weeks. Wow. Because I have not even gone to the grocery store. I've been having everything delivered. So, um and of course, there was a ton of traffic and we're like, oh, my God, we should have just stayed home and had it delivered. <laughs> I, I am venturing out tomorrow morning for grocery yeah. shopping. It's been it's been over a week. It's been like, wow, I'm looking at the calendar mm -hmm. over 10 days. Um, it's just Chris and I, the two of us. So um, it's going to be interesting. Uh, I, I don't look forward to going to the grocery store because people are so scared. Mm -hmm. I know. They, they, they're just not dealing well with this. Well, nobody was scared where we were. I mean, people were just out and about, like nothing's happening. It was tons of traffic. I'm like, you know, the, the, the whole city has not opened up. It's only, the only things that opened up so far is you can get, if a restaurant has an outdoor seating area, you can get takeout and eat outside, but you can't like get table service or any of that. Um, and they've reopened like dental offices, they can open. Right. But everything else is still supposed to be social distancing 10 feet away. I don't know. Here in Louisiana, a lot of people are just not compliant 100% with the rules. Um, and I just hadn't been out. I had heard that, but I hadn't been out. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's just like normal traffic. Like, I sick. mean, I, I hate to say it, but it's going to be interesting to see in two weeks yeah. how George is doing. And I'm not. I I'm know. Not, I'm not hoping Georgia does poorly. I don't want to see people get sick and die. No, I hope that it does well. And then that says that it's okay to open, you know, but. Or leave your guns home. Please yeah, leave your guns we'll home. Yeah, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I, gotta, I want to throw this in because you mentioned dentists. It was funny because when all this happened, I was just on my way, when I was on my way back down to Peru, my dentist is in Peru and uh -huh. has been for a million years. And I had just, called him and said okay you know are you going to be I'm coming down at the end of February, first week in March second week in March are you going to be there and I sent him my x-rays and all that stuff because I go up here every year every once a year I go here I get a I don't have a dentist here but you get these postcards about annual physicals and they'll do x-rays for a hundred bucks or something because it's so impossibly expensive here mm -hmm. and I go and do that and then I ship everything down to him and uh, so I had this like $6,000 bill that I sent him that they said I need for two crowns and a cleaning or minimal stuff. And he, he and I always laugh and he sent it back to me and it was going to be like 1200. And I said, you know, we should start, I could promote that 
for $6,000, you could probably come to Peru, see Machu Picchu, get and all, get your, your dental get work. all your dental work done. <laughs> no, That's it's really tourism. medical and tourism. Good, yeah, thing. and yeah. good dental work. He's excellent. You know, I mean, it's just, he's been my dentist for years and years and years, and I don't have any problems whatsoever. Does he have a big fancy office that he cost him a fortune? Absolutely not. Um, it, it's nice. It's just a regular, like a good old fashioned dental office. Do I have his cell phone number? Have I met his family? Yeah. You know, it's, it's still done that way where, you know, everybody. And I thought, gee, you know, I wish I was better at business because I just don't promote. I'm not, I'm just that this would be, and he, he said, absolutely bring them down, you know, not a problem. <laughs> And, and yeah, I need, I, once, I need his information. <laughs> yeah, I once said to a friend who was passing through in 2011, I was, well, I, I was in Peru for about eight or nine months, maybe more. And a friend was driving, he was traveling just down the Western coast of South America. And when he got to Peru, he was up in the North of Peru and he called me, he said, where are you? And I was in Lima at the time. And he said, all right, I'll stop by and say, hello. I don't want to spend a lot of time there because I don't like big cities. Well, okay. And he came and we met and then it came up in conversation that I was, I had a dental appointment. He said, oh, geez, don't even say dentist. I need like $22,000 worth of work. And he had crooked, you know, mm -hmm. uh, he didn't have good teeth. And I said, you know, just for the fun of it, Dan, why don't you just go see Eduardo? And he said, well, I'm only going to be here a few days. I said, well, just go see him, see what he says. Maybe you can come back some other time. Mm -hmm. and, and he went and he saw him and <laughs> he decided to stay for three weeks in Lima. And in 2011, it was still somewhat affordable. And he rented a room <laughs> and he, I think it was, what did he spend? I don't know, maybe four thousand dollars. You got a yeah. brand. It was so beautiful, and this is a 2011 or so. To this day, um, and he fell in love with Lima because how can you not love Lima? I know I like and, Lima a lot. Yeah, it's a great and, city. Yeah, and and he was amazed, absolutely amazed. And it's like Eduardo says, he said, "You up here was he said medicine is so corrupt." Mm -hmm. And he's his wife is born in the United States. She's they. I mean lived there forever he's peruvian and uh it's just amazing to me so i wish i i was better at business with promoting stuff i'm just all i can do to just do my little thing that i do <laughs> but um yeah I have, I have i have two friends who are americans who live in mexico and they tell me that americans who think that we have some kind of special health care in the united states are fooling themselves mm -hmm. One of my friends lives in Playa del Carmen and he said he went for a dentist appointment between the x-rays, the actual surgery and the follow-up. He said, I was, I was in, in and out for under $200, highly qualified young lady was his dentist. All the equipment was brand new. And then another friend of mine used to live in Austin, Texas. He lives down outside of Puerto Vallarta, about an hour and a half north of Puerto Vallarta. Um, and he tells me all the time because him and his wife, they moved because healthcare was too expensive in the United States. And it is uh, really expensive between the drugs and the doctors being just as qualified as American doctors. He's, he said Americans and, and my friend Mark is a Republican and a conservative. He's not a, you know, he's not a, oh, the world is wonderful kind of guy. He, <laughs> he did his research before he moved there. And he said, America's screwed up when it comes to healthcare. It's really yeah. screwed up. So it's funny living here in the San Diego area, there's huge buildings just south of the border that are dental complexes. And a lot of people who live here go across the border for their dental work. And I, I have a funny dental story. Again, I think it was the second time my family went to London and my husband had a toothache and he's like, oh my God, I'm going to go have to see a British dentist. And he's like, you know, horrified out. Thought and he got there and the dental office in London had equipment that was way more modern yeah. than the dentist he had been seeing for 20 years in Chicago. So and, and you know, there. I know it just Americans need to broaden their minds a little bit. I know I, I was in Florence one time. It was before I was in travel. I was doing um, I was taking a course in archaeology at one of, at the university during the summer for like I forgot you studied weeks. archaeology. <laughs> and uh, and anyway, I, I before the class started, I spent like a week in Florence by myself. Like Lance and I had gone to Turkey, and then he flew home, and then I had like this week in Florence in between. So I said, oh, I'll just rent an apartment and hang out. Well, I get strep throat, 
And I'm like, uh, you know, and of course I had no travel insurance, you know, because whatever. So <laughs> I didn't have a travel agent. <laughs> so yeah. I literally, um, but I had like a guidebook, Lonely Planet or something. So I, I went to the back and it had these contacts. Oh, if you need an English speaking doctor in Florence, here's some names. So I called this guy up and went to see him and it was like 50 euros for the entire thing. He tested me, he gave me my drugs and no insurance, nothing. He's like, up oh, 50 euros. He's like, yeah, I'm from England. My wife is from Italy. We fell in love, blah, 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 moved here. And now I have this practice. And I basically just work with tourists that get sick when they're traveling or students who are studying abroad who need like an English speaking doctor. And anyway, it was amazing. I was like, oh, this would have cost me like 300 bucks with insurance back home. Yes. <laughs> you know? yes. So yeah, I know. I, I agree. It's, it's... So Nina, I think you're onto something. <laughs> you know, it's absolutely all we have to do is get everybody's x-rays and send them down. He can quote, you know, how many days you need and we can work around that and there and we're off. Berna, yeah. have you been to Northern Peru? So you, you like I have archaeology? not. I have not oh, been to God. Northern, the really Northern part. I've only oh. been to uh, Machu Picchu and like, you know, I did my dig at in the Sacsayhuaman National Park area. Um, that was like in 2010. And, uh, but no, there was a program at LSU where I was studying uh, that had uh, a dig up North. Um, but anyway, it didn't work out. So. So Myrna, you're like the Renaissance woman. You're an I, am. I didn't know an archaeologist. A oh my god, a travel you have advisor. To go. I, can, I know. I, I do want to go uh, back to Peru. I love Peru. The north, the north is just it's well, first of all, you know, Peru because it's so diverse, it's like mm -hmm. every country in one, but the north, the civilizations are so much older. Yeah, and, no, I and know. it's and it's more of a mud brick pyramid there's no stone complex yeah. except for Pachapoyas except for Quilap the sister city to Machu Picchu that was stone because it's high enough um it, it's crazy stuff I can post photos it's just crazy. yeah so one of my friends actually worked on a site up like while I was doing my stuff in Cusco she was actually in the north doing a similar thing with a different project and so yeah it's amazing um yeah I went because I was asked to speak I was part of a group with a bunch of um, other people at, a, at an archaeology conference and it was 2009 I think so we traveled with the Ministry of Tourism so we did get to go on on a few digs yeah it's really fun and see how they do it and then we got into these rooms full I have photographs just packed floor to ceiling of mummies that they had not yet even started to look at mm. and it was just it was really fascinating but yeah. it's so crazy because people were they mummified intentionally or was it because of the climate like it was a natural process? No, these were all found on the digs. Yeah. But, but now, I don't know how they died, I don't know. <laughs> no, but I mean like were they wrapped up like a mummy or was it just like their bodies were desiccated? Many of them were, well mummies were not wrapped up in Peru. Yeah, there's a place like that in Mexico, I think outside of Oaxaca where they had that where they, you know, buried people and there you rented the barrel space and after so many years if your family didn't pay for it they dug you up and they found all these preserved people and i don't know if they still have it but they had this museum where you would go up and they had all these like desiccated bodies like lined up against the wall I yeah mean, I, I can post lots, kind of of, lots of pictures of mummies i mean they are just still the hair they're all dressed up yeah i i didn't yeah happy. no i would love Especially, to see that yeah yeah it's, I went to the one in Arequipa, the little ice maiden. Uh huh. I went to that museum. <laughs> yeah, I got I got down I got down to Arequipa, but I didn't get to the north. So, but I yeah, Peru is a great place. I've sent clients there, but um, I haven't been back since. Well, if you ever get clients who ask, let me know. I can really I will show you the, yeah. the back the back ropes. But I posted some, a, a beautiful video a couple of days ago of the Udo's floating islands on Lake Titicaca. Oh yeah. That's, yeah. that's but me. it's done by Tidilaka, which is my favorite hotel there, although I'm really angry at them. It's a story for another day. I, these hotels are starting to have, when you on their websites, on their home pages, you know, the benefits of booking directly with us. I know, so, it's not good. It's well, not thanks good. a lot, guys. You know, in I know. the meantime, we're, we're all friends. I know you. We have dinner together. I've been there. I, I go, I go, it's only, a, 
why do you do that to us? You know, do hotel. I tell them do hotels. Do you, you do do what you do well. Let right. Do hotels. Let us do the other stuff. You know, we're going to sell it anyway. So I'm really furious when I realized they posted that. And then if you go to their website, it's like book, book not now. Can, I know. You not that you can book anyway, but right I know. Now. Yeah, that's one of the hotels I was trying to get a hold of someone rich that we could do a walkthrough tour of the property because it's beautiful. It's only 16 rooms and it's right on Lake Titicaca and it's, um, well, very beyond five star uh, kind, yeah. kind of thing. But I'm, they own several. They just opened a new hotel in Arequipa, by the way, it's beautiful. And uh, but uh, yeah, these places, it's like, stop, you know, it's hard enough for us since tourism boomed in, in especially in a country like Peru. I can only hear me talk about Peru all the time because it's the only thing I do. Mm -hmm. So I can't really speak much about any place else. That's why I love the whole idea when Rich did Travel Unites Us, because I get people who say to me after they've traveled to Peru, you know, we want to go someplace outside of South America, because I pretty much have South America covered, although Peru is my specialty, and we want someone like you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm terrified to refer anyone because I want to know who I'm working with. And so this platform on Travel Unites Us too helps mm -hmm. us meet other people, which is what I told Rich, because I knew around with you guys, I don't mm -hmm. really know you and don't participate in the big travel industry stuff because that's not what my company is right and and um and they say we don't want to go anywhere ever again on a different kind of tour other than what you did for us in peru and it's like you know i can't dare refer you to just somebody i haven't met because mm -hmm. you know here it is in peru i don't even send you to a hotel where i don't know the people who run yeah it or, you know so how am i going to send you to pompeii you know right yeah without knowing someone who can do what I do. So this is just such a, I'm so thrilled. To, this is one of the miracles that's for me, that's come out of uh, this time at home. At, at well, I yeah, I think that's one positive of all of this is we've all gotten to know like our colleagues and our suppliers better because there's nowhere really, I mean, yeah, we're spending more time like on these calls and these meetings and, and just talk, just talking to them. Um, outside of the craziness, like a travel trade show where you have like three minutes, you know, it's easy to schedule a Zoom call with somebody and talk to them for 15 minutes and really get to know them a little bit better than, you know, the old format. Um, yeah. the, my host agency did their retreat for this year. And so it was really nice. We got to really talk to people. I, like, I think the old ways of doing things are dead. I really do. I, I frankly, I have no interest in sitting in on webinars with people who are just removed from me and it's you know 70 of us and i'm done with that I, it just doesn't it doesn't keep my attention anymore and i can't understand a consumer who wants to sit through a sales pitch from you know a corporation that way either i think mm -hmm. i think we're embarking into a new world yeah. Well, I'm so glad because I was spared from all of that, again, having not participated. And Rich, we'll have to, I don't need to tell a whole group of people my story, but I was listening to your story. You would love to hear my story. And I would have never had this company. I would have never developed Ancient Summit if I didn't go through a, a divorce that left me homeless after a very comfortable life. So we can, we can, I can share my, my horror story with you, but, and I was about to commit suicide when I decided oh my gosh. To, when a voice came to me and I, I didn't know what to do, but one thing I do know and love and I'm passionate about and have amazing connections in is Peru. I was like, okay, well then we're going to just start bringing people to Peru out of no, I had no idea. I didn't even have to use a computer. So travel to this day i don't know what i'm as far as travel yet we were the ones who could get our people out in february in march when the borders closed faster than most anybody because i've got that connection on the ground mm -hmm. and that insider uh knowledge and and and, and uh, availability of people who 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 can make things happen and 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 so that's what i do i don't have host agency or tie mm -hmm. into anything like that but which by the way i became a um oceania agent the other day does it 
I heard they did. I heard they did a uh, a seminar or something. Yeah. No, I didn't do a seminar. Huh? I don't want to do a seminar. I have. I am not a travel agent. They, I was a client of mine. I had a client who was coming in on a uh, you know, uh, on a South America cruise on Oceania, getting off in Lima. This is a story. And finally getting, finally thought she was getting to Machu Picchu. They were there in 2010 and we had those terrible, the avalanche and the floods and, and where Machu Picchu was closed for three months. It was terrible in the whole sacred valley. It was, it was a disaster. And they were in the sacred valley and, and getting ready to get on the train to Machu Picchu when the floods happened, they never got there. In the interim, she had something terrible happen in her life. She's a double amputee. She's amazing. She's my idol. And uh, she still travels, she walks. The only thing she needs is a wheelchair access room or cabin. She walks all day, she's fine. And so they, she said they took this tour that would end in Lima, actually end in, up in the North. And I convinced her to, no, there was a different client. Anyway, and we were gonna pick her up and take her up just on a really quick trip to Machu Picchu. So lo and behold, a day out of, uh, of arriving to Lima, the borders closed in Peru. <laughs> and they were coming up from Chile, from the from the Cape. And, oh, and no. so they had, had turned around and they weren't coming to Peru. And she's on this Oceania cruise. Well, they took, and then they got back to Santiago and she's emailing me from there. She said, well, they're gonna give us an escort to the, we got a flight, we can get home from Santiago. Lo and behold, by the time they get to Santiago, they closed their borders in Chile. So they drifted, I think, for um, like 10 days before they could go through. The, I think it was the Panama Canal. And I heard about that, yeah. And she would email me from the ship and said they had 100% all provisions, everything, all en entertainment going on as usual. I guess it's the benefit of taking a such a uh, high-end cruise. Mm -hmm. And no one had come down with any symptoms. So she said, I don't know if I want to get off the boat or not. And go, back. <laughs> go back to yeah. America and all the craziness. Yeah. But um, as a result, because she lost part of the cruise, Oceania gave her credits. And she said, look, I booked a, another tour that'll end me in Lima for November. And I booked something over in Europe for uh, uh, next April. But they want me now to name a travel agent. Can I name you as my travel agent? I said, well okay you know i don't know what that means but sure the next thing i have this mountain of paperwork with their reservation numbers i have no idea i sent them to her to my client i said you know i don't know what i'm supposed to do with this stuff but here it is and here's your and and i, I don't know i uh, <laughs> i it looks like at the bottom that they pay very nice commission they do I, they do i they do. will be fine they're very helpful. Know. The reservations people are super helpful. Just call yeah, I'm them. I'm going to call them and see, because it said something about signing up, forming an, an account, and it says, what's your agent number? And then nowhere on that document is an agent number. So as far as an agency number with, with uh, Oceania, I have my seller of travel license and all that stuff. So it was it's like, I don't want to sell more travel. I, no, I shouldn't. That's <laughs> the wrong way to put it. I, I, I'm not a salesperson. I can only sell to you what I know and love. And if right. it goes outside of that realm, most I, most you, most you good sales people are that way. Yeah. So, which Jenny. I don't know, Rich if, and Myrna. Uh, it's hard for me to say Myrna. I'm so tempted to say Mirna because it's a which Spanish is fine word. because it's fine. That's the Spanish version. Yeah, and and uh, you know I speak Spanish a lot during the course of the day. Yeah. So, um, I guess Rich, you heard me when I was. Wilfredo, it was weird for us because Wilfredo and I usually speak in Spanish. So it was weird for us to be speaking with you in English that day. We did the tour. The, we visited his home. Um, is there, are you going to have a mastermind or a class or something about how, the question that keeps coming to my mind right now is how much do, well, I, I'll say I, I don't know what everybody else is doing because you have host agencies. How much do I invest right now in marketing for the company? Do I, I mean, it's- well, I have, here's what I would no tell you. Because, because of the issue we all discussed a little bit earlier, we don't know, your, your market is dependent upon airlift. The Caribbean is dependent on airlift. Places where 
you have no idea what the air capacity is going to be to get travelers to your country. To me, you're better off just doing organic marketing right now. You're better off. Uh, I mean, if you want to spend a little bit of money to, to populate some ads, but you don't do that just to get awareness. You do that to try to capture email addresses, contact information, because if somebody's demonstrating an interest specifically in Peru now, then you know when, when airlift comes back and the country opens up its borders, that's the time to start selling or marketing. But until then, you know, it's, it's really a very soft sell. So yes, we have a program where we do that. Myrna, our main program is about about the sales funnel. How do, you, how do you take your personal brand, gain awareness, put people into the sales funnel through the tools that you know, mostly social media allows to use, and then start to have a conversation with people so that you engage them. And then when they're ready to buy, you know, they know, love, and trust you. So that's kind of what Myrna and I do for a living. Um, so we could talk about that offline. Yeah, we could do that because I don't, I've never paid for ads anyway. We don't do that. My, my market is so small. I don't want to, I don't, I couldn't yeah. handle a big, I do right. such personalized work. So, right. um, but what I have been doing, I don't know if you've seen or not, is uh, Hi, Joan. on social media every day and I, and, and, and on LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram, I'm paying for that. And I'm wondering, and now our blog, we sort of let go of uh, last year and I need to, I'm talking to writers and this is all money just for keeping interest. What I'm just trying to do, as you know, is keep hope alive, keep people fascinated by it. And Correct. that's the and thing that's, to do right now. That's what you should be doing. I'm right not, I'm not offering sales because. No, I'm, no, it's ridiculous too. My whole, what is it called? The hashtag that I came up with is in the meantime. Mm -hmm. and that's cute. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's what, I, and again, with the Wilfredo, trying to keep my guides, trying to keep my people, because I have real people on the ground there who are suffering. Yeah. And, yes. and I mean, these guides, they've never, they don't do anything else. Well, maybe we can start yeah. selling Wilfredo. Well, stay, stay tuned, because I've been talking with a fella in Australia. He <laughs> is trying to start a program where tour guides and their families can make some kind of money producing um uh content for children to stay engaged while they're in lockdown at home so i'll, I'll talk to you about that in a little bit um but um there are some people out there who are very focused on the guide steven otto who runs a company called walks out of boston he's also trying to figure out ways to raise money for his tour guides because they're all independent contractors small you know entrepreneurial businesses in local markets there's yeah. a bunch of people thinking like you're thinking so stay tuned I'm trying to get um, Tony, my friend in Australia, to do an interview with me this way we can promote his little gig. Um, and I've said to Tony, I, you know, my idea is to make sure you have a tour guide in every nation in the world. And, and at, at least one, you know, where somebody can um, sort of own the cultural content. It's called a letter fr from the world. Um, so you can go to the website. He just launched it today. And I've been waiting for him to launch it to start talking about it. So he gave me permission to start talking about it. But you'll hear more about that. There's millions of guides who are in that position. Guys, I have to run. I have to jump. I off, do too. It's been fun. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to yeah. say. So let's, let's connect. Yeah. Yeah. I'm... We can talk next week about all that. It'll be yep. fun. All right. Okay, everybody. Bye. Thank you for all the blessings. Have a Bye. great weekend. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.